Hi, I'm Emmanuel, and this is a case study of my late aunt who suffered from agoraphobia. So, what is agoraphobia? Agoraphobia is an anxiety disorder characterized by a fear of certain environments and situations, and in my late aunt's case, an inability to leave the house. Michelle was growing up, very nice kid, very friendly, a loving kid. Michelle was a very nice child. She was born uh, in August, and um, she was a, a really nice baby. She got along with everyone. Uh, she was easy to please. She ate well, and she developed very normally up to a certain age. She got along with her sister Sophia and Caroline very, very well. Michelle was quite a bit younger than I was, so I was more of a, um, I played more of a mother role as she was growing up, but um, we, we played together, we went places together, we really liked each other, and, and Caroline too. Caroline especially loved Michelle because they slept in the same room. To me, she was a very loving child, a very good, and she had good grades. By the time Michelle was born, um, Esther was already kind of done raising kids. So um, Caroline and I took a huge role in, um, in raising Michelle. She was in middle school and elementary school, she was doing good. I would say she was a B student. She was an excellent student uh, in elementary school. She had a few nice friends. Uh, she was a little bit introverted, I would say, but um, she, she did pretty well in school, starting in middle school is when um, her affect began to change. Around the age of 14, Michelle began spending time with Max. Max was um, a, a bit older than Michelle. Michelle was, um, I think, 14, and Max must have been 19 at the time, which was quite old, much older um, than he should have been, really, uh, as a first boyfriend. But I think he was a little bit immature, and Michelle was quite mature, because she had older sisters. And, um, you know, I didn't know him that well, but he was a nice guy. Sweet kid, he used to come by the house a lot, and he had a car. Well, it was about the time that Michelle started seeing Max that she's, she started exhibiting some strange behaviors. The relationship with Max impacted her life by being more quiet, not being friendly with everybody, uh, wearing glasses during the day eating only once a day. And her, her affect um, changed. She became kind of flat in her personality and um, she stopped going out during the, the uh, day. She kind of was a person who kind of stayed home a lot and she started wearing dark sunglasses, even in the house. Well, her agoraphobia started when she was around 14, which is when she started seeing Max. And um, she didn't want to leave the house. She said that she felt a burning sensation on her skin when in the sunlight. So especially in the summertime, she never left the house. And um, she became quite introverted. I think she also started having these bite marks on her neck. Do you think those were from Max? It's possible possible. Not hickeys, but bite marks. Oh, bite definite lacerations. bite lacerations, bite marks with a little bit of blood on the, um, on the neck and she didn't seem to worry about it. How did Michelle die? Tell me about Unexpectedly, that. Unexpectedly. It was very sad. She died of a heart attack at around 35. Michelle died of a heart attack at the age of 35. Tell me about Michelle's father and how did he die? We don't talk about him. Yeah, so she was suffering from uh, agoraphobia when she first became my patient. Um, and she came in to see me essentially about that problem. So that's, that's why she became my patient. I first met Michelle when she was 25. I was referred to her 
um, through Dr. Abbott, who was her psychiatrist at the time. The reason why she came to me is that I have a lot of experience dealing with patients who have anxiety, who have different phobias, and so my experience seemed like a good fit to help her. How did she get out of the house and, and, and come to see me? She could go out at the night time, so she came to see me actually in the night. So when I first met Michelle, our first session, um, she came across as someone who had a lot of anxiety. She seemed very nervous about our meeting. Um, she was dressed in clothing, um, which I later would realize that that was her most comfortable sort of dress. Um, she often was wearing a turtleneck or a scarf, um, which later I realized that she had um, the scars from her previous abusive relationship on her neck, and so that was part of her covering up those scars. So my clinical impressions are, are somewhat confused. Um, I think that agoraphobia is, is complex because she obviously is willing to go out at night. Um, I looked for signs of schizophrenic disorder, bipolar disorder, and didn't find any symptoms of those. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think she suffers from a, a, an abusive relationship that we can talk about some more, but uh, those are my general diagnoses. So by the time I met Michelle, she was already 25, and she had been experiencing these symptoms of agoraphobia for almost 10 years at that point, which made my job a little bit harder because she was already very set in her ways. She had decided that um, the outdoors were not safe, that sunlight and just being outside was not safe for her. Um, so for example, an accommodation that we made was we picked a specific room in the house and we made sure that all the blinds were drawn in the windows, that it was dark and felt safe to her. Um, we had to compromise a bit that there had to be some light just so that way I could see my notes, we could see one another. But at first, it really was important to create a safe environment for her. And for her, that sort of environment was one that was dark and enclosed. Yes, yeah, so uh, the medications that I put her on, um, originally I put her on 20 milligrams of Celexa, and I later increased that to 40 milligrams. Um, I put her on uh, 20 milligrams of Abilify and 2 milligrams of Ativan. And I would say none of them had really much effect on her symptoms. Um, I think that, as I said, because I had seen her only in kind of her adulthood, um, we spoke a little bit about her previous relationship um, as a teenager, which ultimately led to her bar to her marks on her neck, and she seemed very averse to speaking about it. Um, I think that, like I said, enough time had passed that she had sort of accepted it and didn't really want to go there with me, and that was unfortunate. As I said, she covered it up, so clearly she was aware of it. Um, but it just seemed like something that she was okay with. It was just another part of her and not something that she really felt comfortable whenever I tried to explore that side with her. Yes, I would say that Michelle was aware of the fact that her agoraphobia was detrimental to her lifestyle um, and was quite, quite conscious of that, yes. So Michelle was uh, convinced that the sun was actually physically harmful to her, um, which is definitely an extreme case of agoraphobia. As I said, I have experience dealing with phobias, um, but I had never seen something that acute in terms of someone really feeling like the sun was going to do them physical or emotional harm. She had a strange reaction of, of, of feeling it, it, it imposed a kind of immortality upon her, so it clearly had a strong effect on her, and yes, I do think that that is the basis of her problems. When I'd speak to her about, you know, say the fact that she covered off the scars on her neck, or the fact that she didn't want to leave the house, especially during the day, um, the fact that she needed darkness, um, that just seemed like regular things to her. As I said, you know, she's been act she'd been acting that way for a long time and had gotten into a set routine, and that unfortunately made it very difficult for her to see these as um, not the way a healthy adult human would function. So, uh, as far as her peculiar behavior goes, there, there was one quite dramatic incident that occurred in my office. 
I had cut my finger uh, the day before and I had a bandage on my finger. Uh, and suddenly in the discussion she said, you know, can I suck the blood from your, from your injury? And, and I said to her, you know, that's a very strange behavior, it's not really an appropriate thing to ask me. And she just dashed uh, up and grabbed the bandage, ripped it off and, and started sucking the blood from my finger, which was, uh, as you can imagine, quite an unusual behavior. To get a better sense of Michelle's inner psyche, I decided to interview her former boyfriend, Max. To search for Max, I looked in the Brookline phone book and found his mother, Jory Resnikoff. When I called Ms. Resnikoff, I was delighted to discover that Max was the one that picked up the phone. Max was hesitant to do the interview, but eventually agreed to do it for $2,000 and without any cameras in the room, just a microphone. What is your name and date of birth? Max Resnikoff, May 28th, 1973. Where do you live and are you employed? I live in Brookline, Massachusetts, on the outskirts of town. I'm not currently employed. And you live in your mom's house? Yes, in the mansion, ever since she died. And when did your mother die? The summer of 1984. And I noticed in your bedroom, um, you seem to have a coffin instead of your bed. Can you explain this? Well, what can I say? It's a little more comfortable without the sun. How did you know Michelle Hartog? Well, we met in the park. We were both taking a walk. And can you tell me a little bit about your relationship to her? Well, we dated for a while. She's my ex. Can you tell me a little bit about why you left the lacerations on Michelle's neck? I'm an immortal. I was giving Michelle the power of the immortals. I shared my blood with her. Can you tell me a bit about your power of the immortals and how are you so young even though you were born in, 1970, in the 1970s and how did Michelle stop aging? I don't, I don't want to answer that. If you're interested, I can show you Michelle's bedroom. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. So it was up here. This is kind of an attic room. Yeah, and you mentioned that she, on. And you mentioned that Michelle kept a video diary? Yes, she did. I can and show it And it's in this you. room. Um yeah, this is where she slept. Um it's not the biggest room in the house, but it's a cozy room and she liked it. So, um we keep her things here. This is a copy of um her video, video diary. diary. At first, Michelle's video diary was quite normal, but after a while longer of watching it, I found this. Hi, this is Michelle Hartog. First off, if this is the fucking cops, oh shit. If this is the fucking cops, you can go fuck yourselves, okay? Okay, second, I'm sorry for stealing blood from Mass General Hospital. I apologize. In Michelle's video diary, she claims that she had stolen blood from MGH. Can you tell me about that incident? I'll tell you honestly, um, it's very uncomfortable for me to talk about that. Is it possible for you to say something, though? Well, in short, um, what happened was is that one night she snuck out of the house um, at around 10 o'clock, which was quite unusual for her because she was so agoraphobic. Uh, but anyway, she left and she um, got herself downtown to MGH, uh, where she found a lab uh, on Wang 2. And uh, she stole lots of blood uh, that was in little vials. And um, one of them actually broke and spilled all over her. Uh, she put the vials in a bag and left uh, MGH and came home with the bag. And, and this was to consume the blood, you think? Well, yes, in retrospect, it was to consume the blood. I mean, at the time, um, I, I didn't quite know what she was doing with it. and. Uh, as you can imagine, I was quite upset by it, almost as upset as when my own kid came home reeking of marijuana. Actually, I should say even more upset because it's really unusual for, you know, a young woman to be stealing blood from MGH and coming home all bloodied. I mean, it was quite harrowing. 
After browsing through more of Michelle's video diary, a harrowing apology came to fruition. I'm also sorry for eating my neighbor's kid. I remembered that the Hartog family neighbors were indeed murdered, so I decided to interview them. But Jeremy was the sweetest boy. He would never hurt a fly. He was full of life and energy. Everybody that met Jeremy just immediately fell in love. Yeah, he was the happiest kid that you could imagine, and I, I just loved doing stuff with him. And he's, come on. Well, he, I, I, I know this is gonna sound strange, but I, I was, I had some dream of some woman that was tall and pale, and she turned into some kind of, some kind of bat. And the strange thing, I didn't know it at the time, that I had the same dream. And, and it's, you know, now we think more of a vision of, of something that was actually happening. Um, and, and we both woke up and heard something in our house that sounded to me like our front door opening. And it was hard to tell when we were dreaming and when we were awake, because it all seems like just a horrific dream. A nightmare, but we came downstairs um, to see what was going on. It sounded like there was a door, and we thought we heard an animal. Um, you know, we have a dog, and she's sometimes gotten out in the night and run around the house, so I just thought it might be her. Um, but we, we came downstairs, and there was no one here, no animal or dog was, was in her crate. We, we didn't really understand, you know, why our door was, was open. It wasn't just the door, but I thought I heard an animal running yeah. through the house. Yeah. And so we both came downstairs. It was a little scary, and so we came down together. And the door was unlocked, but we didn't see anything. But then we had a, a, a suddenly a feeling that something was going on in, in Jeremy's room. And again, this is where I, I don't, I, don't I, I felt like the whole thing was some bad dream, but I had this feeling or vision maybe that this, this bat that we'd seen this woman turn into was now in our son's room. So uh, we, we got really scared and, and ran up there just to make sure this was just a bad dream and that he was okay. And then that's, that's when we found him. Well, it wasn't, I don't know. Or found what was left of him. I don't even, it, I wouldn't even say it was him. I mean, it, there was some kind of remains in his bed that like bones and looked like his skin to me. It's just um, first boy. We just called the police right away. They they came and you know I, I didn't we didn't want to go in there, but he, he they said something like it was some evidence of an animal had been up there. They didn't know what kind of an animal, maybe a wolf or a bat. I, I don't understand what kind of evidence they're referring to, but but our, all I know is our son was gone. He's gone. We really miss him. We hope maybe that that wasn't him, that maybe he'll come back to us. Sorry. I mean, that's, that's enough. After looking her up on the internet, I found that Michelle was the suspect in a murder that happened in my grandmother's home years ago. So, I decided to interview the detective and the victim's mother. Tell me about the missing persons case of George Friedlander and Julian Bressler. What happened in that case? Well, believe it or not, there are videos that you can download on the internet which show people who are either hurt or killed uh, for some kind of sexual thrill of the observer and the perpetrator. And Julian Bressler and Friedlander were two young guys who I think were kidnapped or lured into a situation, enticed maybe, where they ended up uh, being victims in a snuff video. I, I don't remember exactly what date he was kidnapped. Uh, George was very independent. He comes and goes whenever he wants. And sometimes days will pass before I hear from him. Um, I always will text him or email him, but he doesn't necessarily uh, email back. So I didn't think much about it. 
until I got a package that he was murdered and I couldn't watch the, the, the video because I, I couldn't and then the package also said that I couldn't I shouldn't go to the police because if I do then I'll, I'll be murdered myself and uh, obviously these stuff videos please watch them looking for perpetrators of these kind of horrible acts try to figure out who makes them how they distribute them anyway these two guys disappeared and uh, they were then identified as having been killed uh, in the making of a snuff video and what was particular about it was that both of them had lacerations to the neck and they both were uh, severely hurt and uh, I think they were decapitated. It was a gross, gross thing. I think I was uh, paralyzed to do anything. I just sat there and didn't know what to do exactly. How did the case end? Well, the case ended because I was actually shown part of the video by another detective and I recognized the room that the video was taking place in and I realized it was the basement of the hard time home. I could tell by the refrigerator and the paint pot table and the placement of some things, the color, it just rang a bell. But I was pretty sure about it because I had been in that basement a few times helping Maurice with some house junk. And, you know, I realized that these two guys died in, in, in my neighbor's home. So then I talked to the, like, at the police station, we sat down, we said we better send a team right over there. So a team went to, over to the house, a team, a heavily armed team, to investigate and see what happened. And uh, they pulled up a bunch of squad cars, a bunch of cops, a bunch of detectives. This was taken very seriously. And uh, when they rang the bell, Michelle appeared. And Michelle then looked frightened. The police said they were there to investigate. They wanted to enter the house. She didn't say much. But according to the guys who went, I did not go on this investigation, but according to the guys who went, she transformed herself into what they said was a bat this big. And it's unbelievable, but that's what they said. And she flew off. This was daytime, the sun was out, it was a sunny day, and uh, she started to wither. And her or her or the creature that fled the house started to wither and, and, and died. And that was the last anyone saw of Michelle Hartog. Did you know that Michelle killed all those people? Well, um, yes, I did. I was very disturbed about it. And why did you not go to the police? She's my sister, and I um, wanted to protect her. You know, if you kill a lot of people, then um, you go to jail, and I didn't want that for her. And, uh, you know, I really did debate with myself for a long time about what the right thing was to do, and I just didn't have the courage to turn her in. Did she kill anyone else or give anyone else immortal powers? And actually, can you read this letter that she wrote? I actually found a letter in her stuff where she confesses to the murders. Can you please read this aloud? Yes, this is a letter that we, um, we found um, and we read uh, after Michelle died. Uh, it says, Dear family, years ago I was given the gift of immortal powers. Due to this gift, my boyfriend Max and I ate my neighbor's child, Jeremy, and decapitated other children who live in the neighborhood, Julian and George. Now that the police have caught me, it is time for me to vanish. Best, Michelle. 
Did you know that she killed anyone else or gave anyone else immortal powers? No, I don't know that she killed anyone else or gave anyone except for Maurice immortal powers. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about her giving Maurice immortal powers? Well, you know, I'm not that in touch with him, but after she gave him immortal powers, he moved um, out of the country to Romania. I think he moved to uh, Transylvania. and. Um, he lives there, and it's kind of weird because he, he never ages. He hasn't aged in 20 years. Can you tell me a little bit more about this, that he hasn't aged in 20 years? I know Michelle also seemed to have not aged in 20 years. I think that uh, they both have immortal powers. I think Michelle had immortal powers, and Maurice, I guess, uh, received them from Michelle. I don't really know how that happened, but uh, the guy is extremely youthful for his age. Thank you. How did that affect me? Well, you know, to this day, I don't know what's true about it. How can I know? I mean, guys I trust told me that this happened, but it makes no sense. It's not believable. So I think in some way that Michelle Hartog had a power over people. She lured people to her house to die, and I think that she somehow or another convinced these police officers that she was t transforming herself into some kind of creature that escaped. And I believe that she had the power to do that, to make people believe things which clearly weren't true. And yeah, that affected me. It affected me to think that something like this could go on in my neighborhood, and also that a person could have power over other people to that degree. But we all know that people can get people to do strange things, and people can get people to believe strange things. But Michelle never reappeared.